What do those processors look like? Well, one of the big challenges, and I don't know whether you're actually going to cover that in any of this course, but there is a course in the virtual school that we teach on programming many core processors where you would learn about how it is that you program these beasts. And they are rather complicated to program. There's no doubt about it. You get a, may get a factor of 10 increase in performance, but there's a lot of sweat equity that goes into actually achieving that. So these are built on things called streaming multiprocessors. There are actually 16 of them on one of those chips. This is what a streaming multiprocessor looks like. It actually has 32 cores on it. Each of those cores can do floating point and integer arithmetic, which is very different than in the past. Uh, they can do this fuse, multiply, add uh, uh, instruction that I was talking about. There are all these load store units, there are special function units for sine, cosine, reciprocal, square root, and things like that. Plus they have all of the interconnect, the shared memory, the caches, etc. So these are relatively complex beasts to program, but nonetheless people are now developing an understanding of how it is that you effectively program cram them. And we've actually seen some pretty spectacular increases in performance if people really pay attention to uh, exactly how it is that you effectively use this kind of a machine or this kind of a chip. This kind of a chip. Uh, so that's not the only thing that's happening. AMD is going down a slightly different route. It says, well, you know, there are some parts of the calculation where you really need to have a CPU. But there are other parts of the calculation that can really make use of these streaming processors. Right now, right now, limitations is the communication between the CPUs and the GPUs because that's done right now over a PCI bus. Why not put them both on the same chip? And so their fusion chips, in fact, are designed to do exactly that. They are looking at what now they're calling an application processing unit that fuses the x86 CPU cores with what they're calling a SIMD engine array. That's just the streaming processor kind of idea that we talked about with the NVIDIA Fermi uh, chip itself. So this has a very high speed interconnect between those two so they can transfer information back and forth. Uh, very rapidly. They can also have a very high performance memory controller that connects them to the memory uh, in the system. So this is an example of what it is that you're probably going to be faced with when in a five-year time frame is that you're not only going to take what you're learning about multi-cores here, but you're going to have to think about how it is that you program many cores. And by the way, that may be a heterogeneous architecture like what AMD is talking about because this eliminates one of the current bottlenecks that we see in many core processing which is the slow PCI bus between the CPU uh, and the GPU unit. So that kind of gives you a look at where we think the technology, the basic technology is going. What do some of the systems actually look like uh, that we're talking about? So back in uh, 2006, NSF released the solicitation for a machine that was capable of delivering sustained performance approaching 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second, so a petaflop, on real applications, not on benchmarks, but on real applications that consume large amounts of memory and are that work with very large data sets. So they were looking for an extremely powerful but also robustly configured computing system. Something that at the on first glance you might think would be almost impossible set of criteria to be able to satisfy and they were challenging. Why were they interested in doing that? Because they already saw from talking to the community of computational scientists and engineers that this level of computing was going to dramatically increase the capabilities uh, of being able to simulate very complex phenomena. Uh, one of the applications, the one way over in the upper left, that's a polio virus. That's a schematic of what the polio virus looks like. 
Now, I don't know how much all of you know about viruses, but viruses are considered the smallest living thing, despite the fact that they can't reproduce themselves. And that's what causes us the problem, because the way they reproduce themselves is to, is to enter our cells, grab a hold of our DNA machinery, reconfigure it so that it makes copies of itself, make so many copies, of course, that the cell ends up exploding and dumping all of those copies of the virus out into our bloodstreams. And of course, it's the cell death that's associated with all of that that gives rise to all of the problems uh, that we have from viruses. What's not well understood at this point, although we have a general understanding of it, but what's not really well understood is how the virus actually gains entry into the cell. By what mechanism does it end up injecting the units needed to take over our DNA machinery? How does it inject that into the cell itself? It's possible to actually model that atomistically, and that's one of the problems that we're going to see done uh, on blue waters, is a real detailed atomic level study of exactly how the polio virus manages to get into our cells. Uh, other problems are dealing with tornadoes. Uh, what kind of conditions actually give rise to tornadoes? Can we get to the point where we understand enough about how tornadoes are generated that we can predict in advance when a tornado is going to be generated, not once the tornado is on the ground and is already a threat uh, to life? Currently, we don't understand that. We cannot bottle it in sufficient detail to, to really predict when a tornado is going to be generated and when it isn't. We put the conditions that we know led to a tornado being generated into the computer. Sometimes we get a tornado out of it and sometimes we don't. What they're really hoping to do with petascale computing is in fact to get a much deeper understanding uh, of that particular phenomenon. And it just goes on and on. There are many, many areas of science that will be impacted by petascale computing and that's to me, one of the really exciting things about scientific computing is that it has an impact across so much of science uh, that there is almost, at this point, no field of science or engineering that's left untouched uh, by advances uh, in computers. So what do you need to be able to um, solve problems like that? What do you need to satisfy the criteria that um, NSF laid out. Well, as we talked to the science and engineering community, one of the things that they said was, uh, give us as powerful a core as you possibly can. Because if you don't give us very powerful cores, we're going to have to scale up to very large numbers of cores before we can get the performance that we need. And we're not sure we can scale our codes up that much. So they wanted very powerful cores. They wanted a low latency, high bandwidth interconnect because this was the other critical issue as you'll find in scaling up applications is what's the latency and what's the bandwidth of the interconnect that, that connects all the processors together. If the latency was zero and the bandwidth is infinite, your problems would scale really well. Unfortunately, that's not the case and we have to deal with latency and bandwidth. They wanted large, fast memories. There were some problems that really required significant amounts of memory to solve. Uh, they needed a large fast I.O. system and data archive because some of these, some of the problems uh, actually generate large quantities of data or they consume large quantities of data. So you've got to be able to move data between memory and onto the disk and then eventually onto the archive itself uh, if you want to save it. And then finally, there's the issue of reliable operation. Clearly, if the machine's not reliable, it's not very useful for any of us. So we wanted a machine that was going to stay up, not just for minutes or hours, but a machine that would stay up for days uh, and a week or so. So what does that machine look like? Well, we proposed Blue Waters. Uh, as the machine. It was a machine that was under development by IBM, funded by the uh, DARPA's High Productivity Computing System Program. So DARPA, as well as IBM, was investing in this. It was built on entirely new technologies that IBM had been developing in its laboratories. One of those was the Power 7 chip, 
down at the lower left. It has eight cores to it. Each core can support three threads. So these are simultaneous multi-threading cores. So you have 32 threads uh, for each chip. It has an L1, an L2, and an L3 cache that are on chip. The L3 cache is fairly large. It's 32 megabytes. Uh, and you can either associate that cache with a particular core, or you can let all the cores share the entire cache itself. So it's actually, in some ways, it's the, one of the first programmable caches that you'll have. There'll be some things that you can actually do to influence the behavior uh, of the cache. 256 gigaflops peak performance. So yes, it's not the, the Fermi performance level, but it's a third. Uh, the Fermi performance level, uh, all on one multi-core chip. Uh, 128 uh, gigabits, that should be gigabytes, per second of memory bandwidth. So it has very high bandwidth to memory also. Those chips then are actually put into something called a quad chip module. That's the next one up uh, on the, the view graph there. Uh, there are four Power 7 chips that are associated with this quad chip module. This is the basic computing unit, so it's not the chip itself. That's not the basic computing unit. The basic computing unit is this quad chip module. With that quad chip module, there's an associated hub chip that allows that chip to communicate with all of the other chips uh, in the system. So it's four Power 7 chips, uh, 128 gigabytes of memory, associated with that chip, uh, one teraflop peak performance. So that quad chip module is a teraflop uh, peak performance. It also has a hub chip that allows it to move data out to the rest of the system at greater than a terabyte per second. So there's a tremendous amount of bandwidth between this chip and all of the other chips uh, in the system. All of those are packaged into something called the IH server node, uh, which is eight of those quad chip modules. So it's an eight teraflops uh, server node. Has a terabyte of memory uh, associated with it. It has eight hub chips, the power supplies, the PCI slots. slots. One really important thing is it's fully water cooled. You can't quite see it. Uh, on that picture, but in fact there is copper tubing that is snaking all throughout that system so that it's cooling the memory, the hub chips, and the processors. So all of them are water cooled. That's about a 40% gain in energy efficiency right there because water is so much more effective at removing heat than air uh, is. Those are then assembled into the building blocks. The building blocks are three racks. I should say, by the way, that although it looks like a nice small uh, node there, that node weighs 330 pounds. So it's really quite heavy. Uh, those are all then assembled into the Blue Waters building block, which has 32 of those server nodes in it. So that's right there is a quarter of a petaflop. So that three rack unit is a quarter of a petaflop uh, system. 32 terabytes of memory. There is four storage systems that's actually in that building block. They have greater than 500 terabytes, so a half a petabyte uh, of storage of disk drives in there. And then there are 10 tape drive connections that are also associated with that to the archive system itself. All you do with Blue Waters then is you take those three units and you just keep replicating them. So those are the basic units that are replicated to build up the entire Blue Waters system itself. And it'll have something on the order of 40 uh, of those three rack units uh, that make up uh, Blue Waters itself. Peak performance is going to be around 10 petaflops when you put them all together. Uh, as I mentioned, one petaflop uh, sustained, uh, and so on. You can sort of see the characteristics there, but it's also given on this next slide. Uh, there's, any time we switch from Mac to PC, it 